Good evening and welcome to the February 26, 2015 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and we'll begin by having the clerk call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Ms. Blue Duvall. Present. Ms. Laura Fallon. Present. Ms. Pam Hanna. Present. Ms. Ann Hennessy. Present. Mr. Downey Meyer. Present. Ms. Lisa Minnick. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Carrie Nyklachuk. Here. Mr. Ed Zuhalski. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. So we'll begin the meeting this evening with the public comment period. Um, and I have actually two separate sheets, um, folks that have signed up. And uh, we ask you to please limit your remarks to three minutes each. I have a timer. And if you could please state your name and address for the record, just so the clerk has it. Um, so I'll start with this uh, sheet, uh, Kimberly uh, Schlichting. Okay. Get that close. Or? Excellent. I'm very sensitive about Amy. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be careful about that. No, Mr. Your Exactly. So um, I'm Kimberly Schlichting and I live at 6 Middle Street in Hadley, Massachusetts. Um, I have taught at Northampton High School, or excuse me, in Northampton for 17 years. 11 at middle school and 6 at the high school. And I'm here to say a few words about a potential late start at the high school. I believe that it is not beneficial to the, high, to the students of Northampton High School to have a late start of a mere half an hour or 30 minutes that would cost $90,000 plus. This money would force the elimination of approximately 9 to 12 classes, depending on the number of teachers, etc. cetera. Um, therefore, there would be fewer choices for the students, fewer electives, and the remaining classes would all have more students. The overrides passed in recent years show that the citizens of Northampton value more classes, more electives, and retaining the arts also the music programs and AP classes. This diversity of offerings make Northampton High School a stronger school that attracts many student of choice um, students from outside the district. Taking $90,000 out of the budget and eliminating um, these courses for a mere 30 minute later start time does not seem like a wise trade-off. Thank you for considering my opinion. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. The next person who is signed up is uh, Jeremy Whalen. Hello again, probably sick of seeing my face, but I'm Jeremy Whalen. I live at 214 Pomeroy Lane in Amherst, uh, but I come as a uh, representative, I'm a the technology teacher at the high school. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, tonight about the proposed late start and the uh, the impending cuts that would uh, happen as a result. Uh, the first thing I want to do is kind of reframe how we've been looking at this. The first thing I want to do is I want to commend actually all the individuals that are proponents of the late start because they're looking at this in a scientific way and they're saying this is beneficial to our students. And I think that that is often lost in the fact that when I come here and I say that I am opposed to this, I am not opposed to the idea of uh, enriching our students with, uh, with what is clearly uh, has been uh, uh, studied scientifically, but what would happen, the detriment that would be caused because of these cuts. Uh, and I think it's important to really frame that appropriately. So we're not against a, a later time. We're against, uh, and, and I speak for myself and many of the teachers that unfortunately weren't, uh, are not able to be here tonight because of eighth, uh, eighth grade parents' night at the, at the high school. Um, it's, it's something that uh, as, when we're, when we're looking at 90 plus thousand dollars, uh, it's, it's a very, uh, these these things enrich our our classes, and we are able to uh, proudly provide a, a wide range of courses uh, in both electives and in our in our advanced courses, and uh, to uh, to prioritize that late start over some of these other things. I think it comes at at, at a lost uh, ultimate an overall loss uh, for our students. So. Uh, Speaking to many of my colleagues, uh, almost unanimous, unanimously at the high school, uh, teachers are opposed to, to this uh, for the, the reason that it would be, it would, uh, be so detrimental to uh, the in-class uh, curriculum and resources that we offer. 
um, I would love to see uh, us uh, look at this. And I also uh, extend um, my, myself uh, in uh, looking at different ways that we can approach this, maybe on the back end in making uh, a parent to parents, uh, maybe a campaign of sorts, a task force of sorts, to look at this for uh, encouraging uh, healthy behaviors at home before uh, they come to school, so getting to bed uh, sooner and doing campaigns. Uh, we've had great work with the uh, Northampton Prevention Coalition on uh, drug abuse and, um, and drug statistics. We could also look at uh, things of that nature for campaigns uh, for uh, getting to bed uh, earlier. So again, I am not opposed to a, a late start, but in this plan I am very opposed, and many of my colleagues are too, in, in essence of these, uh, these very harsh cuts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, the next, perfect timing. Um, the next uh, speaker who's signed up is Paul Voss. So, uh, yeah, my name is Paul Voss, and um, I am uh, in the education field. I teach engineering at Smith College, and um, see uh, the sees the, the results of our education system firsthand. Um, I'm very uh, concerned about losing teachers, about trading, about possibly trading teachers and firing teachers uh, and reducing the classroom experience for other uh, benefits which might include the, the late start. Um, I have not been opposed to the late start. I'm very open-minded about it, but when it, we start talking about numbers like $90,000 and letting three people go, uh, about losing arts or losing uh, AP classes, the cost is far, far too high. And I would just encourage you to, to um, take that off the table and make sure that the money is going into the classroom and, and, and not into fuel and buses uh, if that's the choice. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so those were the three folks who had signed up tonight. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak uh, during the public comment? Going once, going twice. Okay. Excellent. Um, we'll now move into our reports and recommendations uh, part of the agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda is a gift, and uh, this requires a vote of the school committee to accept it. And it's uh, a, a gift of software for the NHS social studies uh, program. And I believe, I'm not sure if uh, we'll speak to it. Uh, Business yeah. The Northampton PTO um, wishes to make a donation of $125 to the high school for an online timeline generator software license for use by one of our social studies teachers at the high school. Okay. Move to accept gift for the software of Northampton High School Social Studies. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Uh, Ms. Minnick. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to have this happen. My question is, didn't we have a discussion and about whether or not people can specify what a gift is for and is this in violation of what we just said we wouldn't do? Well, this is the PTO that's yeah. buying supplies for the schools. And I, I think it's in response to a wish list. And I think we posted, so. yeah, I think that's a, that's different so than the other areas where we've talked about that. Okay. I'll, Although I, I would like to note that it really should be referred back to, to policy rules and policy. Um, because I thought it was supposed to be already, but we really do need to look at that and examine, okay. you know, the wishes. So, okay. So I, I, I looked at the genesis of the policy, and I believe that it was not actually, though you could read it as saying we don't want to allow people to restrict gifts, and I think there's a logic to looking at that in rules and policy, but I think it tracks from a mass general law that says that it will be spent at the school committee's discretion because otherwise there would be a problem with the fact that the cash gift was not appropriated. So, so basically it says, there's, right, the master law says you must spend everything according to your budget except in the case of cash gifts which can be spent at the discretion. So I think that's where the policy came from and that has nothing, that has nothing to do with the policy, issue, policy issues about accepting restricted gifts. So just so that we're, ours would be an additional kind of restriction. Okay. And when was that? What do you, um, when you when looked at the law? Yeah, when did we, we make that response so I can look it up and, and see it since I'm oh, on you can policy? You can just look up the policy and it says at the bottom the source and it's the MGL section and you can look it up. I, I was under the impression Here. that this was already in rules and policy. I thought rules and policy was already taking a look at this. Am I? 
It's scheduled we to rules and policies. To, I just haven't had a meeting it's, scheduled, it's scheduled yet. We'll just have to have a meeting. Okay. Yes. So I believe it already is there for study. Sorry to have taken us off track. No problem. No problem. <laughs> I'm assuming. Just one. I was, I, sure. So, so the 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 software belongs to the district. It's a license, so, so it the only license. Be, I believe it's a one-year license. But it belongs to the district for the year, so that, that year, so like yes. Teachers at JFK or anywhere could, who had. No, it's it's. Could, I I don't have the specifics work? on this package, but a lot of times the licenses are limited to the number of users, so it's uh, possible for one hundred twenty-five dollars. It might be limited to one user. Like a one. I, I can check like on on one machine or something. Yeah. Okay. Any other um, uh, any other questions or comments? <laughs> I was resisting the urge to make a timeline joke about the Mass General Law, but okay. <laughs> all those in favor of accepting the gift, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much to the uh, to the PTO for that gift. The next item is the um, vote to accept a gift. And this is the gift of a mural for JFK Middle School. Um, and I believe we have folks, Heather Brown is here to discuss that. And um, I'll recognize you and your colleague who I'm sorry, I don't. Michelle Mallory. Michelle Mallory, sorry. Hi there. Hi. My name's Heather Brown. I work at NHS. I'm the, one of the ELL teachers. And I'm Michelle Mallory, one of the art teachers here at JFK. So we are the masterminds of what we're calling the JFK Community Mural. Can you hear me okay? <coughs> okay. So I have a little slideshow behind you, so I'll just refer your attention to it as, as I ask Mr. Provost to do the clicking. Not yet. I'll be happy to comply. <coughs> yeah, you can click to the second slide. It's just a few slides, so you may not need to move too much. This one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's <coughs> Okay, so we are here because although you have already seen the proposal when you reviewed the NEF proposal to grant for the grant, um, because the mural will be on the exterior of the building of JFK, at the front of the building, in a pretty prom prominent location, we've been asked to come again to present in order to confirm that you support us in this project. Um, so I, I work at NHS. Previously, I worked at JFK for a few years, and I live in this community, so I'm very committed to the community, the youth, and to community development in Northampton. And I see this project as based <coughs> in community development and in youth empowerment. Um, before working at JFK, I worked as a muralist in Philadelphia, and I worked on a project in South Hadley, doing a mural at Beach Ground Spark. So these are just a couple of pictures from that project. And as you can see, it's completely, it's student driven, lots and lots of collaboration with youth, and this project at JFK will be the same. Do you wanna go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. So this is the proposed site. You can see there's two walls there. We haven't decided which we're going to paint on yet. I would love to paint on both, but <laughs> Leslie Wilson has just encouraged me to limit myself, and I think she's <laughs> probably wise in, in starting small. So we're gonna pick one of these walls, and the mural will be painted after school and over an April break camp with JFK students and also with high school students who are going to apply um, to be a muralist assistant. Um, and then after April vacation time period, we will probably be working on touch-ups and working on really polishing the, the mural and making it look sharp, making it look really professional so that it can serve as both an inspiration to beautify the community and also as a symbol of the project um, to show a positive message for us for many years to come. Okay. Next slide. So these are just a few images that I wanted to show you just to give you a general sense of what it may look like, right? So the theme is going to be, um, is going to be developed with the youth and with the students. So I really can't say what it will look like yet. We have some ideas, obviously. We're artists, we're always thinking. <laughs> but we want the, the theme really to come out of our conversations with the youth. The top left mural is the finalized mural in South Hadley that I did um, with the Youth Commission there. It was actually partially funded by Spiffy. And it's based on some activities that were done in South Hadley around the Above the Influence campaign. 
the other three murals, one of them I did not work on, but the other two I did in, um, on, in Philadelphia. The bottom right mural is one of Martin Luther King on the side of the seminary that he attended out, outside of Philadelphia in Chester. It's a really, really fun project. And then the mural to the left is inside of a phoenix. Um, and on the top, you can see that's inside of a school. And the theme of that mural was um, education as a form of empowerment for youth and inspiration, connection to the greater world community. So um, again, this is really theoretical. I mean, it may look sort of something like this. this it, they, these murals all have inspired me, and, um, and so it may reference that stylistically. But um, I just wanted to give you a general sense so that you had an idea. Um, and as school committee members, you know, we welcome your input and your questions in order to help us to develop this project. Does anybody have any questions or questions? Yeah, you can turn the lights on. Thank you. Are there any questions from the school committee? Mrs. Binnick. Um, I think this sounds like an incredibly exciting project, but I also have a concern, and I'll okay. tell you from whence my concern arises. It's due to the fact that I sat on the committee that did the renovation of this building 20 some odd years ago. And I just want to be respectful of the architect's view of the building, the, you know, the architectural facade, the balance and, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Sort of the, I, I just want to be sure. To it fit looks, in architecturally right. so that it still feels good. Well, that yeah, that's part, yes, partly, and I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want somebody to, like, hang something gaudy or tacky from the front portico because I think the thing has architecture, you know, strong architectural lines that were designed to look a certain way and maybe even to um, evoke a feeling of an old-fashioned schoolhouse cupola or something like that. So, I mean, whatever the architect's intention was in designing the building the way he did, I don't want to come along after the fact and put something that will detract from that. It looks to me like the two walls that you've selected, one is very much off to the side and farther recessed. The other one, is it facing the side parking lot or is it actually facing Here, the Do front? you want to go back to that one? It's the, just, uh, the second slide. So to the right of that, per that farthest to the right purple box is the front entrance. Right, but so is that wall facing the front or is that facing, facing the side? Facing the front, so it's it very is facing prominent. The front. Okay, it's yeah. very, okay. It actually faces the sidewalk a little bit. I, I mean the parking lot a little bit, it's on a slant. So it doesn't okay. face yes. the slide in front of the It's not a right. Okay. It, it is kind of on a slant. However, okay. it's very visible from the road and from the front of the building, from the bus Well, wall. which is not inappropriate for, the, for a school building. So I, I'm not sure that I'm saying I don't want it there. I'm just saying that I would want to be careful about positioning a mural on a school building. I want it to be visible to the community because that's part of your intention in putting it there is to create community. And yet I do want to be a little careful about you know, a, a traditional look to a building that was designed in a specific way. So I guess now that I've grilled you, I would ask if we could get, you know, a, a recommendation from the principal of this building. Not that she wanted to be put on the spot, but <laughs> I would expect to be. She knows me too well. <laughs> My recommendation, as far as the project, or as oh, far I as hope that your recommendation, as far as the project, is that it go forward. Absolutely. I'm just asking about the location of the mural, maybe. Um, I, I think that what we would need to do is we'll take a look at the plan um, and see where it makes the most sense. I, I, I'm very much with you uh, around maintaining the integrity of the front of the building. I also think it will add something to what we're doing here and it'll really reflect the culture of JFK and our community as a whole. So I think it, we'd like it to be in a place that is really visible. Um, but I do think that the choice will be made once we have an idea of <coughs> going to look like. Okay. I, I was leaning towards the back spot. I'm not sure that they were. Um, we haven't <laughs> really yeah. had this conversation, but I think we'll have some thoughtful, uh, you know, planning of where it's going to go. Okay. Ms. Duvall? Um, while I understand what Ms. Minnick is saying, I also um, kind of think that if you're going to design a school, 
it's kind of like a classroom. You have a classroom, and then the kindergarten teacher comes in and decorates the school. So to me, it seems like if the architects were to, architect were to designing the school, would be flexible to the creativity and the community and the student-generated art that would be put on it. I don't see that it would be disrespectful to it. I mean, maybe if, you know, something disrespectful to the student population in, in general, you know, against what we believe in. But as far as just artistic <coughs> and what I've seen up here, I don't find any of the four up there to be tacky at all. Um, and I'm sure that, that they still wouldn't be tagging. No. Oh. I never meant to imply that. I, I, well, I know, I know. But, but you know, but it's like going into the different schools. When I go into the different schools, all four of the different elementary schools have different projects and different focuses on the wall. And each one, it creates who it is as a as a, as, a, as, an, as an entity, as that school, as that culture. I think that JFK can have that. I think personally, having been here, went to JFK myself, so I've seen JFK for years and years and years and too many years. And I think that it's gone through changes, but I think the changes are positive, and as long as the students are the, the, the thought, even if it's wrong, I don't think the architect would be offended. I think that we're doing what's the most right that we believe that we can do, and I have faith in and Miss Wilson and I have faith in the art teacher and and the other woman who worked for years, so, and it's great work up there too. I also want to say I think one of the thing the one of the best things mm -hmm. that we've done here is actually take down some of the artwork that was <laughs> originally here that was not student work, and the entire building is full of student mm -hmm. work, and that was just such a, an amazing thing to do. Um, as far as empowering the students and also having them take some ownership and some pride in their building. So I think this is just another way to continue on um, that path with our kids. I agree and I also just wanted to say because as we come into this room all the beautiful art, the arts on the wall and how it's continually being changed and I'd love to be able to see that it's reflected because I think that one of the problems that we have with our community, I was just talking to somebody who's going to be moving soon so they don't have to go to the high school and got into a conversation as far as that goes. And I think that what people perceive to see and what actually is within the buildings and is there is, is really different in some ways. And I think that I really wish that we could get out there and see things like that, you know, and, and just be more community minded that way. And I, uh, Mrs. Minnick. Um, and I, I have one further final concern, I think. Can I respond to that first? I was just going to say that I hope that we can honor all of the people who have made this building beautiful already and at the same time give our students a voice in how it looks and make them feel at home here as well. So a balance between all of these things is sort of what I'm going for. But yes, go ahead. My last concern is actually a very um, practical <laughs> consideration and that is if there should come a time when someone decided they did not like that mural, when you paint on any kind of masonry like that, you end up with a problem taking it off, don't you? I mean, then you have to sandblast, and I wouldn't want it to damage you the structure. Defaced, or I'm I'm saying 30 years from now, if someone decided they did not like that mural, or if they wanted to remove it, if mm -hmm. there was a desire to remove it, or if uh, it became less uh, contemporary with what people were thinking and you and they wanted to paint a different mural or if they just want you know if for whatever reason if it were defaced and it had to be removed um, are we talking sandblasting or is this something so the technique that we're hoping to use is to paint on canvas and then glue it to the brick which oh. is very <clears throat> it's typical these days it's oh. been being done for about 25 years in Philadelphia and the murals have stood up very, very well. It's just as good as, as any other paint. The glue is very strong. Um, in that sense, it is permanent. And so in 30 years, if people change their mind and they don't like it, it would be very difficult to remove the glue and the canvas. It would have to be painted over or covered. Have, have we spoken to our maintenance crew to find out how they feel about all this? Central Services is... Um, very much in support of this and so they have all the information they have the paint and the canvas and all the supplies and um, yeah they're very much in support of this so. thank you and just as a historical <coughs> note um, to further date your service on that committee uh, we were actually we're paying making the final payment on JFK <laughs> right. this year uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we're, paying off, we're paying off the mortgage this year on the on the renovations yes, that were left over at the end can we replace these chairs I apologize <laughs> profusely I hate these chairs there's none left over <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So, Ms. Hennessy. Just a quick, I really love this, and I love that you're using high school students and middle school students together and really empowering them. And I also think that there's a, such a possibility to include, when it's done, elementary school students. I know my first graders, is it Saul DeWitt? Is that a oh, muralist? Yeah. And so my son is studying him in first grade right now. And so I was thinking, wow, well, like that would be great to kind of bring in some of the elementary schools in this in the future. I think it's great. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, it'd be great to do more public art projects. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So any other um, any other questions or or mm -hmm. other ideas or concerns? Okay. So then the issue before you is a motion uh, to vote um, to yes accept the gift of this mural being applied to JFK Mills. Make a motion to accept the gift of the mural for JFK. So, uh, second. Okay. So, this is a motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And thank you very much. Congratulations. Good luck. Do you mind passing me my? I'm trying to Sorry. reject it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the um, uh, next item on the agenda is a vote, um, and this is actually uh, a vote of the school committee. Uh, we discussed this at our last meeting, but we wanted to put it on the agenda. This is a vote to authorize, give the superintendent the authorization uh, to be able to, um, to be able to execute the various contracts uh, that will happen throughout the Jackson Street Playground construction project. Um, I'd like I, to make a motion to authorize um, the superintendent to execute contracts for Jackson Street Playground Project. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Superintendent, do you have anything more to add to that? Sure. I do not. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. <coughs> you are uh, duly authorized. So we will now move on to a presentation by the superintendent. Of, uh, of the first look at the FY 2016 budget for the Public Schools. And I will turn the floor over to the superintendent. Thank you, Mayor. It's my pleasure to come before the committee tonight with my first um, look at the FY16 budget. We've been working on this budget since the beginning of December, and we're looking forward to rolling up the process in the next month if all goes well. Um, tonight's presentation isn't a detailed look at the budget, but is intended to give sort of an overview of where we believe we stand at this point in time and what we're hoping to accomplish in the next budget. Um, our goals are to create a simplified and highly transparent budget document. I'm not um, making, casting any aspersions on prior budgets, um, but what I'd really like to do is wherever possible, um, let simplicity be our guide and let transparency be our guide so that it's a document that um, ideally anyone would be able to pick up and understand. Um, we're also looking to facilitate greater cost center based budgeting. One of the things that um, has become apparent to me and to Ms. Walzak as we look through the current budget is large portions of the budget reside in district-wide cost centers. And that really constrains the ability of principals and school councils to make um, substantive decisions for their own buildings. One of the um, goals of Ed Reform, as you know, was to try to create greater democracy and greater voice and greater autonomy at the building level, um, which is very difficult to do when all the money is sitting within cost center um, accounts. So the idea is not that um, the central office would relinquish its authority. We would still be in the, in the uh, position of monitoring and approving or disapproving what principals were proposing to do with their money, but we would like to try to get uh, more resources to them and less out of centralized accounts. Um, 
Also, using a collaborative process to develop budget recommendations. Uh, I'll be honest, my first time through in Northampton, the uh, budget calendar crept up on me a little bit faster than I thought it was going to, and so we had to um, schedule an eight-hour collaborative meeting on Tuesday to develop some of the recommendations that you see before you tonight. But I think that the other administrators who are here in the room can say everything that you see here tonight was decided as a group and has 100% support of all the administrators in the district. And that's really um, a process that I would like to continue moving forward. Also, um, when you get the final budget documents, one of the challenges, since we're trying to make these changes, is to provide continuity of information from prior budgets to the new budget. Um, because if we're budgeting in a different style, the um, budget. <laughs> 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 If we're budgeting in a different style, it's important to sort of be able to follow the thread going back to prior year budgets. So if you see um, large changes within individual accounts that um, don't necessarily reflect, follow all the way down to the bottom line because they're offset by other changes in accounts, um, it's important to kind of be able to trace the money back to see, okay, so prior to this budget, maybe that money was sitting in a, a district-wide account for special education programs, but maybe now it lives in the building for their special education program. So we want to be able to provide some information that allows you um, to kind of translate from budget to budget as we go through this transitional budget year. Um, and then also we'd like to enhance stability and sustainability along with the city's overall goal for financial stabilization over the next several years. So at the last school committee meeting, the clear directive of the committee was for me to start with a level services budget. If there was money left on top of the level services budget, but below the 2.75% to direct that toward <coughs> late start. But if not, then to do the, um, do the funding for the late start by doing reductions at the high school. So first part of that process is to identify what exactly level services looks like. So here are <coughs> fixed cost increases in a level services budget. One of the things that I'll point out and I think is important to remember all the way through this discussion is 2.75% on our budget is about $725,000. So you can see just Looking at salaries, we're already over 2.75%. Um, next thing um, I, I'd point out is utilities. This is a $176,000 increase. This, I think, is a little bit of an aberration in the budget. It appear, We know that it's under budgeted for this year. It looks like it was level funded from the prior budget. So that really, I think, reflects a two-year increase. I think in FY17 budget, we're likely, barring radical changes in energy markets, to be uh, looking at something more like an $80,000 increase in utilities. But um, we have to soak up that two-year increase in this budget in order to make sure that the lights stay on and the buildings stay heated. Um, supply accounts is another um, area where there's a structural deficit within the current budget, which became a, apparent in many of our collaborative discussions on uh, creating this budget, particularly in the area of textbooks, um, and particularly in textbooks for handwriting without tears and math investigations. Um, because as we were drilling down on this issue with principals, we finally figured out that the money for the textbooks that runs their programs doesn't actually exist within the budget. And what had been done historically is principals provided a textbook order which central office either filled at the end of the year with leftover money in, in accounts or didn't fund. Um, in order to get to a real budget that, that accurately reflects the costs of our district, I think you have to put the amount for the consumable supplies we know we're going to use 
in the budget rather than leaving them unbudgeted and hoping the magic money appears at the end of the year. So we're putting that in the budget. Um, we have increases of about $60,000 for regular transportation. This has nothing to do with late start. This is just the, the cost of maintaining a status quo transportation system based upon the annual increases in our transportation contract. Special ed transportation is up 56,000. Um, again, that's a combination of changes within the needs for special ed transportation and the annual increases in our contract for special ed. Our special ed tuitions are up $34,484. And then um, athletics brings us to another um, structural deficit, which I've been able to, to actually witness because I was here for the closeout of the prior fiscal year and the beginning of this fiscal year. Um, so one of the things that I was handed when I arrived was a bunch of unpaid bills for athletics, which I paid. And then, uh, <laughs> then I was told, okay, you have to, you have to provide $25,000 of what was actually called seed money into the athletic program to get them started this year. Um, and so what I realized um, was the athletic <coughs> budget in no way represents what the actual costs of running the athletic program are. Um, overall, we've been able to figure out that our athletic program is about a half a million dollars. Um, and so the amount that we've been budgeting for that is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the overall program. If you um, actually add up the costs of those sort of unpaid bills that traditionally end up in central office at the end of the year after, fun, after the boosters have done what they can do to pay bills and the athletic director has spent the $25,000 seed money, you're left with about a $47,000 structural deficit. So again, I think if we're going to create a realistic and transparent budget, <coughs> level services should say, we aren't not going to go looking to the superintendent at the end of the year to close out the bills. We're going to actually budget athletics for what it is. And even that doesn't. I mean, this still takes into account extensive fundraising from boosters, but we know now what's realistic to expect from boosters. And when we give you the final budget document, you'll see an athletic budget that shows what we're asking for in the appropriation and what we're asking different booster clubs to raise towards individual sports. Um, another area that's in deficit, structural deficit, is extraordinary maintenance. Um, the amount in the current budget for extraordinary maintenance is zero. So I get calls all the time like, okay, so the pipes are frozen at Ryan Road School and there's no money in my account. What do you want me to do? And I have to say, well, we can't let the kids freeze. So go ahead and fix the heaters. And, and then it's up to Ms. Walzak and I to identify funding sources. Um, in reality, Putting $50,000 for six buildings for extraordinary maintenance is probably in itself a structural deficit. It probably um, underestimates what we need, but I think as we develop this new process that I'm going to be recommending to you, we need to at least start by budgeting something for extraordinary maintenance. And I think it, there's very little chance that we'll fail to run into $50,000 worth of unexpected repairs over the course of the next year. Um, and then another um, item which has to be included in a level service budget that's new is sick leave buyback. Um, as you know from changes to Schedule 19, that was included as a cost to the district for the first time this year and will be in next year. Um, we're budgeting this based upon the number of people who submitted their retirement paperwork by the deadline that we know of. Um, there's a possibility that some people might have uh, submitted their paperwork by the deadline to the wrong person. Um, so that might act, may actually be a little bit higher than that, but we think that's, I think that's pretty close to the number. And then other fixed cost increases from a number of small accounts um, account for another 127,000, 373 
dollars. So uh, level service budget really needs to have about one and a half million dollars. Now, remember, I said 2.75 was about 725,000. So we're over about twice as much as what we should be to get to level services. So to answer the question, which I couldn't answer at the last meeting, can we fit the 93,000 for uh, early start at the high school in on top of a level services budget? The answer is no. So this next page is some better news. Um, and this, this is something that our financial administrator really needs to be praised for. Um, because if it wasn't for this page, we would be in very deep trouble right now. Um, one of the things that she was able to find is that the current budget overestimates salary, salaries for our employees by about $715,000. Um, that excess is due in part to um, some turnover that we've had through the year, but the largest part of it is due to a quirk with Munis and the way ESP salaries are calculated, which essentially ended up in us budgeting for days that ESPs are not going to work. Um, so we're able to um, use that excess in the salary accounts against the 1.5 million, um, which we need to do because we're over the 2.75 limit. Um, however, that's a one-time savings. The budget that I'm going to um, present to you may include some overages and expense accounts when we get to the end of the year with transition and everything, but we're not going to build in 715,000 more than we need. Um, we won't be able to do that again in the prior year, I guess what I'm, I mean in the next year is what I'm saying. Um, also, we have reductions in unemployment expenses um, because if the budget that we're going to be proposing is actually approved, there will be um, minimal cuts. And we have some people who are currently receiving unemployment who are coming off of their eligibility for unemployment. So we think we can reduce that account by $75,000. Um, however, with that, one of the th decisions we made as a team is this assumes that any of the unemployment expenses related to implementing a late start have to also be covered by further cuts within the budget. Is that clear? No. Okay, so what, what that says is it, if we have to lay off three teachers at the high school, we have to lay off another one point, however many teachers at the high school in order to pay for their unemployment benefits. So that's good news. So now I have one more piece of slightly worse news. Um, we also have to take into account revenue reductions because as you know, um, although the local appropriation is the lion's share of our budget, it's not the whole thing. Um, a lot of our budget is financed by grants and other finance programs. And in this year's 9C cuts, the kindergarten quality grant was cut by about $20,000. That's a deficit that came to us a few weeks ago. Uh, We'll, which will be in this year's budget, and we're planning on it being in next year's budget as well. Um, also, our circuit breaker claim is reduced. Circuit breaker is a reimbursement program, so in this year, we receive the money based on last year's claim, and we have a system, which I think is very prudent in Northampton, of spending the money you receive in the current year in the next year's um, fiscal cycle. So really, the, what we're saying is the money we got this year based on last year's expenses is less, so we'll be budgeting less of that to be spent next year. Um, and that's a good thing because it means that um, our costs, the, the, or the number of students who reach the threshold for Circuit Breaker is, was reduced, which means there was a cost savings in special education, but then the bad news is if, you're, if your costs go down, the reimbursement that you get for those costs goes down too. And they don't occur in the same year. Um, so it's not. So we have to account for 
I'm sorry, seven, yeah, $78,616 in lost revenue to get to level service budget. So mathematically, this is awkward <coughs> because I'm kind of changing signs and going back and forth, but if you follow me, our initial, um, Initial figure for the fixed cost increases was one million four hundred seventy-one thousand eight hundred thirty-nine dollars. We had the cost savings of seven hundred and ninety five hundred and fifty-three, which gives us a you know a, a true cost of level service budget of six hundred and eighty-one thousand two hundred and sixty-eight. That's two point six percent. And if that was the only thing we had to say, then we'd say, okay, now we've got a little bit of money for a late start. Not a lot, but we have everything covered and we have something we could put towards that. However, you have to add in the lost revenue because we also have to make up for that in the budget to get to level services. So when you add that 78,613 on, um, the true amount we need for level services budget is $759,899, which is over 2.75% cap. So, you know, this whole thing, if you can just sort of follow these three slides and this math problem on there, kind of um, give you a, an insight into the emotional roller co coaster ride that I've been on with this whole budget. You know, at first it looked like disaster, and then it looked like, oh, we, we're going to be fine. In fact, maybe we'll solve the late start problem, you know? And then it, was, then it looked like, no, we wouldn't. Um, and, and then one of the things that, that we began to look at is, okay, we have, to, we have to budget not only for the current year, but we have to have an eye to the future because we have to get our choices right now because every choice compounds with increases in future years. So we tried to do some projections based upon our fixed cost increases, which we now knew. We knew the cost of our wages, it's already over the 2.75%. And that goes back to the information that we provided at the last school committee meeting. We've got about 81% of our teachers still stepping. The amount between the steps is about 5%, which means for those teachers, the wage increase is really the 5% plus the COLA, which is 6%. Um, now there are some, there's a other, 19% uh, of teachers who aren't stepping who are only getting the COLA. But overall, um, you're looking at about 4% wage inflation just in that one piece of the budget, which accounts for 80% of the budget. And so when you are trying to fit 4% increases into 2.75% budget caps, you realize that you're going to run out of money pretty fast. So we started to look at the future. So um, this, this plan here looked at what if we just implemented a pay-as-you-go system and said we can't do anything except address fiscal cost increases for the next several budget cycles. Um, the green figure there represents the amount of money that we receive from school choice from Circuit Breaker and from some other reimbursement programs, but those are the two main ones. And <clears throat> you, as I said, the, the tradition, and it's a good one, is that you use this year's money to pay next next year's bills. So we're going to build, we're going to give you a budget uh, that has about 1.5 million dollars worth of choice and Circuit Breaker in it um, for next year. We assume we're going to receive that same amount next year. But if you, you do that, realize there's a little bit of a gap um, that's missing in next year's budget. It's about $34,000 short. So what can you do? You could either do a cut for $34,000, or you could sort of break that budgeting discipline, which I think is good, and I'm not necessarily recommending we do, but it's a possibility I need to put before you of spending some of the money we receive next year in next year's budget. If we did that, that would cover the $34,000 uh, deficit. And you see, you 
play that out to the next year, the deficit gets a little bit bigger. If you get to 2018, I think we're in a critical decision because now we're spending um, a lot of the money that we're receiving in the year, in the same year that it comes in. And if you get, when you get to 2019, if you spend all the money that you have left from the prior year and all the money you receive in the current year, you're still needing to do a $452,000 budget cut in order to make that year work. Which is why um, I've said this has to be a pay-as-you-go plan. I'm not saying this is even good, but I'm saying in order to get to 2019 without having devastating cuts, we would have to break that budget discipline and we'd still end up with that kind of a cut in that year. We may, I mean, in reality, the decision may, may be 2017. We may decide then it's better to do some preemptive cutting so that the cut in 2019 isn't $400,000 but um, that, that's something that's very much on my mind and I'd like to be on your mind as we look at these budgets. So the next scenario we looked at, and this gets kind of to my emotional roller coaster, is, well, what if we tried not to just maintain status quo but do something? And, and what if we earmarked $100,000 per year for district improvements, which is roughly about the amount of a late start. Um, that could be first year's improvement. Um, and at this point I was thinking, surely this is gonna work. This is about a quarter of 1% of the budget. You gotta be able to find a quarter of 1% somewhere. Um, but if you add that $100,000 on top of the fixed cost, you see how it changes the projection. Our decision year is definitely 2017 because there we're um, using up $638,000 of the funds we're receiving in the same year we get them. And we're basically spending it all in 2018. And then when you get to 2019, um, you're about one and a half million dollars short. That's just $100,000 a year to try to do something different. So, third scenario we looked at is, okay, either one of those looks that great. What if we tried to um, extend stability within the district by trying to really work hard on revenue? And the goal we had was, could we get it out to the end of 2019 without having any kind of real need for significant cuts? Um, in order to do that, we figured we would have to add 10 choice seats next year and five additional seats every year thereafter. Um, if we do that, you see we kind of build um, reserves for the first three years and then spend them as the wages catch up to us and the utilities catch us up to us in the out years. And we still end up with a deficit in 2019, but it's, it's, a, it's a minor deficit. So the story that all these graphs tell is there's not extra money in the budget and if we don't plan carefully now we're going to be in trouble in a very few years so getting to uh, that meeting on Tuesday that I referenced one of the things I did like is typical in a budget process is I asked the administrators to bring to me what they felt they really needed in order to improve their schools so uh, this is, I did end up showing them these charts, but this is prior to them seeing any of these charts. So this is what they, they came up with. There's $621,000 worth of requests from administrators, none of which are things that I would consider to be frivolous. The first one, $85,000, this is just so that we could have a plan to replace our technology on a five-year cycle, which is a typical thing that you would have in a school district, but we don't have here. In order to do it, we'd have to add that much money to the budget. Um, and you can see that uh, all up and down the line, the, the, I, the items are, are very reasonable things. Um, 
I'll, one, one thing I'll point out is the foreign language teacher at the high school. This was um, requested because sometimes we can't run enough sections to give foreign languages to all the kids who want to have it. Um, so it was just a request not to create anything new, but to not turn kids away from courses that are in the catalog but kids can't get into because they're oversubscribed. Um, the one thing that is a, I collapsed a bunch of these things, as you can imagine, they were uh, items that occurred on, on many administrators' lists. And so one that's a little bit um, unusual that I'll just point out to you is clerical slash lunch support. Those are really two different kinds of things. Um, one, uh, the, the majority of that was increased clerical support that was requested by the elementary principals because when ETLs or team leaders were limited at the uh, eliminated at the elementary um, level, the school secretaries ended up picking up a lot of the work that um, the, the team leaders used to do. And so principals are saying now they're spending all their time on special ed, I'm kind of not getting my work done. Um, and then the other one was for lunch support. Um, in order to provide coverage in the cafeterias and at lunch recess, um, that in, in the, this district is a, um, a separate position because in most most of the levels teachers don't have duties so all the administrators budget requests came up to 621,000 then I showed them the charts and I said okay we're in the pay-as-you-go era so we can do anything that's on this list that you want to do but you have to come up with an equal number of cuts somewhere else so this is what we were able to get to at the end of the day um, the, the real, I think, strongest desire on part of the elementary principals was to have tiered support staff. This year, you know, we put in a half-time tiered support person at each of the elementary schools. They feel that position is very helpful, um, both with students who are having academic challenges and students who are having behavioral challenges. But the problem is those kids don't schedule their challenges to occur on the day when the support person's there. <laughs> So, so uh, they said, if we can do anything, that's what we need to have. So after many hours of discussion, um, they were able to identify um, so an equal number of reductions on the right-hand side to pay for the increases that they wanted on the, on the other side. Um, these, um, these cuts in many cases are due to changes that are happening within special education programs that I can't really talk about at too, level, too great of a level of detail because many times these are positions that are tied to individual students and if I say too much there's a strong danger of me you know, revealing something about the kid. Um, but I, we have an opportunity to make some changes this year based on some movement within programs and the the principal's request, which I recommend, which I will recommend to you, is that we you take advantage of those opportunities we have now for cost reductions in some areas to pay for cost increases in some other areas that they. <coughs> so, this is the disposition of each of those requests. You can see that if. We weren't able to figure out a way to pay for the requests. They ended up getting the red line through them. Um, some of them were funded in part by restructuring and balance eliminated. Um, and some of them weren't funded at all. The net cost of all of the requests is zero. And the same thing has to apply to the high school. So we need $93,000 to begin with plus the unemployment costs of whatever the first 93 ends up costing us, um, that has to come out of the high school. So we began this by saying before we even get started. And just to, cla just to clarify, Mr. Superintendent, uh, just for folks who may be watching, sure. the, the 93 is the cost of adding, of, of delinking the high school busing from the three tier system and creating a separate tier. That's correct. Okay. So we said before we even start to talk about courses, we need to have a fair and objective methodology that we're using because whatever the list is, people want to know how did you come up with these cuts? Why was it these ones and not others? 
Um, so our first criteria was if a course was required for graduation or college applications, it was maintained. And that one may sound a little bit awkward, but I'll just explain why we added <coughs> college applications. Um, one of the things that we thought about very briefly was we could just eliminate foreign language. It's not required for graduation for any of our students because it's not um, been adopted as a graduation requirement. But that will very significantly impact the ability of our students to apply and be accepted at colleges. So we quickly said, okay, we need to, we need to save foreign language even, even though it's not strictly speaking a graduation requirement. If a course was a graduation requirement, then we, it was safe because you can't eliminate courses that you're saying students must take in order to get a diploma. Next, uh, we wanted to maintain course options for diverse learners. So at every level, we wanted to have a variety of levels of challenge so that there was more than one um, level available at each grade level and subject. And then, um, we looked at current enrollment by class, teacher, and department to identify the areas of least impact. Um, because every cut really has three impacts. First, there's the cut itself. Then there's the unemployment associated with that cut. And then there's, you have to put the kids somewhere. So in order to uh, remediate that last effect as best as possible, you have to cut your smallest classes. That means you have fewer kids you have to put into other classes to increase their class size. And then one of the things that became um, clear to us when we started looking at loading charts is the year-long AP classes are a very inefficient use of teacher resources. Because if you have a year-long class that has 25 students, it's essentially, you, you shouldn't be counting those as 25 students. It's as if the teacher has 12 and a half students each semester, because you're still using up two blocks of that, te that teacher's availability to teach. So that made a lot of the AP classes come out as um, low impact classes in terms of the amount of students that would have to be displaced. And then we said, we'd like to give you two versions to consider. Um, one, shelters programs that have been um, approved and supported in prior years overrides. We're, this is not cutting that we're doing in order to, to address any kind of a budgetary catastrophe. This is cutting that we're doing in order to try to create a new program. And it, I think, w respectfully, it would tarnish the credibility of the committee to cut programs that taxpayers have said, please raise my taxes in order to have. Um, so I, we said, let's try that. And then another, another um, theory we had on this as well, you know, two and a half overrides are really only able to direct money for the first year. So maybe we should put all programs on the table and let you see what that would be. So that was the methodology. And I'll share the results. So this first one is um, the cut list where arts and sports are sheltered. First cut is a cappella. That's an elimination. Now that may seem like a, um, inconsistent with me saying that those overrides are sheltered, but that class still ends up on the list because what happened in last budget cycle, last fiscal year, is after the positions were restored, um, I don't know if it was last year's budget cycle, but I know that last year we added an additional class to one teacher's position which was over and above the amount that was brought back by the override. So um, that is an art cut, but it wasn't one of the arts cuts that was, um, one of the arts classes that was targeted in the override. Um, next, AP calculus would be reduced from two sections to one section. AP chemistry would be reduced from two sections to one section. AP economics would be reduced from two sections to one section. AP European history would be offered every other year instead of on a yearly basis. AP language would be reduced from six sections to three sections. AP literature would be reduced from four sections to two sections. 
AP Psychology would be reduced from two sections to one section. AP Statistics would be reduced from two sections to one section. AP US History, like Euro European History, would be offered every other year. Honors US History would be reduced from four sections to two sections. Sociology would be reduced from three sections to two sections. And Sophomore Honors English would be reduced from five sections to four sections. One of the um, consequences of this that I would just like to bring to your attention is we would no longer be able to offer all kids who want to have AP classes the classes that they would like to take. So we'd have to um, create a system to eliminate kids um, from the classes. We'd probably, um, it would probably be a combination of preference for upperclassmen, prerequisite courses, and lottery. And I do think that would leave many students and parents feeling very frustrated. So the next cut list um, holds no program harmless and just says, okay, going from least impact to most impact. Again, acapella is at the top of the list. This is a course that currently has 15 students and is limited in its ability to accept more students. Um, songwriting would be eliminated. Family and consumer science would be reduced from three sections to two sections. American popular music would be eliminated. Music theory would be eliminated. Acting seminar would be eliminated. Acting and directing workshop would be eliminated. Multimedia production would be eliminated. Honors art would be reduced from four sections to two sections. Freshman athletics and JV teams would be eliminated. Ultimate Frisbee would be eliminated. Um, Question. This, yes. So when we say cut list, these are, this would be everything that would be cut in order to make a certain amount of money or these are things that could be cut and you'd have to figure out how much money. These are everything that would need to be cut. You could to do. Make, to make how many dollars? To, it's uh, a, about $93,000 for the delinking of the high school tier, plus another $48,000 to pay for unemployment pay for costs. Okay. And um, <clears throat> could mix and match, but if you were to do that, we would have to refigure. List A works as a, as a um, complete set, if you will. List B works as a complete set. If you go back and forth, then we'd have to do some Refiguring. Uh, in this list, you'll notice there are a lot more eliminations. Um, in the first list, we're mainly reducing sections. This is because many of the courses are singletons that are only taught by the person who would have to be eliminated. Um, so, I just want to um, just want to close with a few thoughts. I hope you know that. As was said earlier tonight, I'm not a denier or disbeliever in the benefits of a late start. Um, I really thought at one point in this budget process that we were going to be able to do it when I realized it was going to be essentially one quarter of one percent of the school budget. But then when I played out one quarter of one percent on top of the fact that we don't have any flexibility due to the fact that our costs are increasing faster than our cap, um, that we got to this point. And another thing is, one uh, an email I got today from someone who I really respect, um, although I have different opinions on, about some things, said, I, I hate the way that the arts are being played off and pitted against <coughs> the start. And I hope you see that I'm not here advocating for uh, arts versus late start or AP versus late start. What I'm saying is the conclusion of all this research into both the head counts, the hub systems, and the budget projections is we'd like to do three things and we can only afford two. We can do a world-class AP program. We can do a vibrant arts and athletic program we can do late start. You can have any two of those that you want. You can't have all three. 
It could be late start in AP. It could be late start in art. It could be art in AP. And I think that at this point, I have to give you my recommendation as superintendent. I feel that the benefits of a late start notwithstanding, these cuts would be devastating to students. Some kids come to school only because of the programs that are on that list right now. Um, and there are many students who need to be challenged by the courses that are on the other list. I don't think it's educationally responsible for me to recommend either of those cut lists to you. So at this point, I think the thing that I would recommend has to go is the late start. But um, I guess what we have to do, the direction I need from you at this point is we'll be preparing budget books for you to vote on. And we need to know whether the budget books should include programs as they currently stand with the no cost changes that the administrators have recommended. That's, you know, status quo essentially. Um, would you like a budget book that includes the cuts to AP primarily to implement a late start? Or would you like a budget book that includes cuts to arts to implement a late start? Superintendent, if you want to trip sure. here, we can, we can um, open the floor to questions and have a presentation. Um, so I don't know if Principal Lombardi or Superintendent would address this, but I know something I've heard from the community is um, with respect to cutting AP program classes is, oh, well, they can take classes at Smith. Could you explain to people the problems once we change the late start that the availability of classes might not be the same? and. I don't, in fact, myself, I'm not sure. I know for AP classes, if they pass the AP exam, they'll receive credit for college. Yes. But that's not true, necessarily, of Smith College classes that they yes, take? Yes, Smith College is Smith College is separate, so that but is something. But they some, don't grant credit, necessarily? They get credit, um, but it's not for another, um, it's not dual enrollment. So if you do a dual enrollment, for example, at HCC or GCC, that's through, you get high school credit and college. Smith, as far as I know, is not a guarantee that that counts toward college. Right. Um, the AP, if you, if you take an AP class and you get a certain score, um, and the college you go to chooses to, you then might not have to, they'll count that, and you might not have to take a biology, or and you can go to the, to the next level. That's, that's a changing landscape, but that's in theory what it is. Um, we have policies about, um, school committee approved policies about students accessing Smith College. Um, juniors can access one. Um, and one a semester and seniors too. Also the problem is is if you take off all those APs, you know, that's a guaranteed source. Mm -hmm. You know, we have this many sections. You know, students every year trying vying to get into a Smith College, there's no guarantee. What happens is they choose, I, I want to take these classes at Smith. They don't really know until the following fall or that spring semester when they show up at that instructor's classroom if this instructor, if there's room in there for them to get enrolled. Um, it's kind of a shot, shot in the dark. Many times they get in, also many times they don't. And then what would happen, those students then who would maybe gamble thinking to get a Smith College class, if they don't get that, they have to default back to something at the high school. And part of our dilemma is uh, we can't really hold a class for those students because that might mean pushing out a student that wants to stay at that class in the high school. Is, is that yeah, yeah, because I feel like there might be a mistaken impression in the community that, that this is kind of a redundancy. Like, oh, well, they can access it. And I don't mm. think that is the case. But, and I think this. I think that, you know, it, it's a, I think the number is like 50, 60 students uh, taking Smith classes. You know, with that type of cut, I'm not sure if our relationship with Smith would really, if it's built on, <laughs> you know, 100 plus. I mean, I think that might be kind of, we're thin a little. You know, I think, I'm not sure if they could handle that capacity if our kids were trying to go into AP Biologies or AP, you know, um, foreign language or things like that. Okay, thanks. Members of the committee, I can certainly say a word or two about my Smith courses and high schoolers, but they don't want to butt in. Um, Mrs. Minnick? First of all, I want to thank the superintendent and Ms. Walsack for Yeoman's work and apparently the rest of the alt team for participating in, in a marathon day of budget planning. Um, and for the clarity and um, 
thoughtfulness of your budget and your recommendation. I also want to commend you for looking at the, the things that have been historically underfunded. You know why we underfunded them. I mean, we got to a point where we said we have to cut X, so we're going to cut it out of maintenance, we're going to cut it out of supplies, and we're going to, so that's why it looks like that. Um, but it was irresponsible of us to do it. Then again, with your back against the wall, sometimes you make some bad decisions. So there we are. Um, but I, I appreciate that you found those things, that you noticed those things, and that you've put them back in at the level at which they should be funded. And who knows where we'll end up, you know, in April. They may be slashed <laughs> again, you know, or at least, you know, partly, partly, um, have, uh, have amputations if they haven't been completely eliminated, but the fact of the matter is that you know that you found those things and that you're that you are suggesting to us you're you're asking us to be responsible and to fund the district at the level that needs to be funded to operate the way it should be. So, I, I really want to thank you for doing that for 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 seeing it and for bringing it to us in that manner. Um, and I don't remember now what I was going to say of any consequence, <laughs> except that I wanted to thank you for the hard work that you, I mean, I, I think that, um, I, I think it's obvious. We've gotten a lot of, of messages. I, I finally have gotten some email messages. Some of my colleagues have been getting them for a week or more. I got a flurry of them in the last day and a half. But it's true, people who have supported the late start time can't support these kinds of cuts. So, and I think we heard that this evening from the, you know, from some of the speakers during public session. So I mean, I think, I think you have done an excellent job of identifying what this would actually cost the district. I can only hope, I, I'm also very concerned by your analysis of what things look yeah. like going forward for the next for the foreseeable you know, three to five years. I think we can only hope that um, some of the comments that were made um, to the commission about the um, foundation funding formula will, will bear fruit, so that, you know, that they will carry some weight with them, that we will see more money from the state, but I, based on my personal experience, I wouldn't count on that. We can't count on that. So again, I have to say, while it's distasteful and I'm glad that you have identified what the future looks like so that we know where we're going there. But, um, but anyway, it's, the, if my, I think in three or four years of 25, we've had a budget season where we felt like we could actually do something, and we thought about was there a program we wanted to add, and this looks like this is another one of the other kind of budget seasons where even with the generosity of our community, we're sitting here looking at what are we going to have to cut to make things work, just to provide the, the not what we would say was the education that we really want to offer for our students, not that we want, this is not the high quality, this is a level, a quality education, this is not substandard education, but it's definitely not the kind of education that we would hope to provide for the students of Northampton. And the final thing that I would say, now I forgot that one again too, never mind, I'll come up with it and I'll let somebody else talk. Mr. Meyer. Um, so my first question is that um, the 2.9 number, now last year the budget grew by 3.35%, appropriation grew by 3.35%, and I'm just wondering, is the fiscal situation of the city that much worse um, that we're receiving $123,000 less? It's, you know, and there may be, right, again, looking to move fiscal stability farther out into the future, um, but I just, you know, that's my, First, um, and I don't know whether you want me to. I'll, I'll address it. I'll, I'll, I'll address it, and um, and I'll begin by saying by adding to what uh, Mrs. Minnick said, and to to compliment and to thank the superintendent and and the business administrator, because because essentially the stability plan in many ways mirrors the stability plan that we've created at the city level, um, which is the very s exact same thing happening. If you look at the larger city budget, you know we've we 
put away the savings from the override and we're trying to live off it as long as we can, but then we reach a point in 2020 where we go into the red. And so the red that you're seeing on the city budget is the same red you know, you're seeing as part of the, the school budget, which is obviously you know, 50 plus percent of the overall city budget. So um, the, the, the issue that we're waiting for, in the 2.75 we have scaled back where we were last year you know, when we gave the 3%, um, you know, the 3% 3.35 uh, 3. 3. exactly yeah. exactly um, part of that's based on wage growth in in this final year of, of some of contracts I know uh, you're familiar with the final year of the of the NACE contract and it mirrors a lot of the same across the rest of the right. city um, and the other issue is uh, <coughs> Governor Baker, um, you know, who's just come into office, and much like described, the superintendent's described, you know, he's projecting that there's a $1.6 billion structural deficit in the state budget, um, almost for the same thing, that, that programs that there were no monies for were filled in with one-time monies or they were filled in with stimulus monies. There wasn't actually truth in budgeting in a lot of those accounts, and he's taking the position that he's not going to do that anymore. Um, and so we've already seen mid-year the cuts to our funding for the kindergarten program, um, and there are actually some other cuts which we which uh, we're not quite sure how they're going to play out. But but charter school reimbursement there was a cut to that, um, and that hasn't been fully funded in many years, and we suspect it won't be funded. So we're waiting right now. We're showing right now on the city side, without two of our big numbers coming in yet, we're looking at. Um, uh, you know, about a about a half a million dollars um, deficit that we're working with. Um, we're waiting for health insurance, which we'll get the numbers uh, next week. The GIC will take its vote. Um, that is a um, that's a large line item. That's ten million dollars of our budget. Um, the GIC is part of Governor Baker's structural deficit. Um, one of the first things they told him when he came into office is, you know, we've got about a 200,000 plus structural deficit in the GIC um, that has to be fixed. And it, it's attributable to a lot of different things, people joining mid-budget mid year and that not being budgeted for. Um, and then they've also got some challenges in just health insurance rates coming in historically higher than they have in the past. So that's gonna be a, a big number. And then local aid, um, the governor, Governor Baker, will release his budget. And that's actually going to be illuminating for, for both city and school because we're going to get our first look at um, including some of the projections on the cherry sheet that will come along with that for, um, for state aid, for Chapter 70 aid, for, for, um, for other revenues. Uh, so we're really... Um, Despite what he said as a candidate, um, which was he was going to increase local aid and try to increase it by the amount of growth in revenues in the state, obviously he's now run into this structural deficit that he's going to have to figure out how to maintain. So we're, um, we're assuming level funded uh, local aid may be the, what, what occurs given the deficit that he's facing. So those are the two big, and then chapter 70, again, $25 increase per year. MMA has been lobbying to raise that to $100 per child. Um, but again, given the, the deficit he's talking about, this may not be the year that that happens. So, so we may have a better picture of it this time next week when we get those, when we get the governor's budget, when we get the GIC numbers, whether we have any additional flexibility. But I really, we really have to be this conservative in terms of our projection. Right. I, I mean, I understand that the, that the factors are outside of your control exactly. to a large extent, but it's just in terms of our, as a committee, budgeting, it, it's yeah. obviously better for us to have a number that doesn't vary by, because, you know, most yeah. people might say, oh, a few tenths of a percent, but that's yeah. positions. Um, exactly. But the other question I would have is, the, the ESP's budgeting issue, was that, did that happen one time in the last fiscal year, or is this something that you, you've seen going back? I believe further? it's been happening for at least a couple of years. In discussion with the uh, city CFO, it appeared to explain some of the, the um, budget balances in past years, too, that were identified late in the payroll cycle. Right. Um, because I guess what I would ask the superintendent and the 
um, the business manager is that that makes me really concerned because I don't feel good about this money. I mean, this is the money that you find under your mattress to pay the rent, mm -hmm. but it only is good for that month. Mm -hmm. And the next month, you're not making the money in salary to pay the rent. That's right. So, um, so I guess this puts us as, as a school department in a much worse situation going forward. And I would be interested to see um, maybe at the next meeting some projections on what do we do to cure a $715,000 deficit um, because that sounds like cuts to me. Um, it's, it's well in excess of, of even a 3.35%. Mm -hmm. and, and the last question is just more of a, um, just an informational, um, just in terms of the salary, the salary increase to 810,000, I'd just be curious if, or if you could give me the information on how that was constructed. Um, what, you know, what were the components? Uh, just because looking back to information that I had when we were negotiating um, our last three-year agreement, we had 262 employees in Unit A, 119 on steps, 143 off steps. So that's only 45% at that point. So now clearly we've had a number of retirements, so we've moved a lot more people on steps, but I just want to look in turn, I want to look at the numbers because the idea is that when people move off steps, yes, they do get that 4.5%, but you're hoping that you're moving from top step to a mid-career hire. And so I'd just be curious as to the, what, what the hiring history and just maybe look at the roster of Unit A to see where they are today. The, the process to come up with the numbers going into FY16 actually involved physically, manually touching every employee and looking at the calculation? And that's what I, that's what I did. I actually, when I built my budget numbers, I asked Human Resources for their full roster and I put every salary and I built that going forward. So um, I'd just be curious. I mean, if I could just get those numbers again, as a member of the negotiating committee, it's critical for me to have that information as we go into a year where we're gonna open negotiations, so. Um, I guess the, the question I would ask, and we can talk about it, is um, if the numbers were coming out of the um, payroll system with from human resources you may have had that same issue with the ESPs oh this was uh, this was unit A so I'm only talking Just about unit it. A. I'm only, yeah I, I had the other information but I since the bulk of our salaries are paid to unit A I used unit A and, and built that out as the cost and then um, added an additional factor for the other units but I'm just again not, you know, it's not going to make a difference in terms of the budget, but just going forward with um, payroll costs, I'd just be really um, interested in having that information. Mrs. Minnick. Something he said reminded me of what the other thing I was going to say was, and I usually save this for next month when we discuss school choice, but in view of the fact that the superintendent was talking about a stabilization and using school choice funds as a large portion of that, I thought I would go ahead and say it this year or this month, which is um, when the state first came up with the concept of school choice, and so most of you have heard me say this before, Laura, this will be new, um, it, it, that we, when the state first came out with this, we took that money and it was like, wow, we've got extra money and we put it aside and we spent $200,000 on textbooks or we spent $300,000 on computer stuff. It was for one-time expenses that were <coughs> extraordinary out of, out of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Over the years, we were very careful for a long time to protect that money because to some extent, it's an unpredictable income stream. Now, once you have students that you've accepted under school choice, they have the right to remain in your district for as, until they graduate. And so it's, as long as we're doing a good job, we might re reasonably expect that they will stay with us and we rely on that, on that funding. We, we calculate those funds. However, they could all choose next year to go someplace else which if you eliminate all the AP classes or all the arts programs, my guess is some of them will leave. But that aside, I think the point I'm trying to make is that we protected that money and used it for one-time luxury purchases um, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then we, set, we, we slowly got into a position where we needed to be using some of it and then a little bit more of it. And it got into our budget. We were trying not to actually pay teachers with it, but to use it for other expenses so that it, but eventually it got applied to teacher salaries. Now, when you have a teacher, that's a recurring expense unless you eliminate that section, that position, that person. So 
it, it, eventually we have gotten ourselves into the, to the point where we are using school choice funding that comes in this year to pay for things that are recurring expenses in our budget for next year. If you start using the money that comes in this year to pay for recurring expenses in this year, and you have nothing set aside for next year, that's the point he was trying to make. School choice is, ha we, have, we have gone from using it as a bonus, a, an end of year bonus from your boss, to using it as part of our, our, our everyday budget. We rely on that funding now. And if it were to change even, you know, only a small percentage, it would be devastating to our district. And so I, I mean, I just, I just wanted to say that it's been a, con it's a concern for me as we've moved gradually from using it for one-time expenses to using it for regular. So you could build a budget with, you know, using 1.5, which is what you got last year, but then you get to the end of the year and you're only getting 1.3, and then yeah. you're, yeah, then, you're then you've got a $200,000 hole with two or three months so left in the only, fiscal year. Uh, so not only are you using the money b <clears throat> before you actually even get it, or what, I mean, or yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You, it's so anyway. It's very frightening. I, I that was not a suggestion for what we would do. I'm just making a comment that it's very unnerving to me to see that we have become dependent on that funding, and now we may actually be using it in current year. You know, and that that would yeah, occur. That would you sort of turn that corner at the 2017 mm -hmm. to 2018 on your charts. That's when you would so slowly flip to that that's current year yeah. so that's going to be a real decision point in right. terms of I, I guess I would suggest that the school committee look at ways of avoiding that mm -hmm. outcome I just want to say that I mean the fisc the, the projections we've been using every year we're reevaluating them so we were you know the, the er first year of the override we infused a lot of money into the schools year two we um, you know, we tried to be conservative. We then came back and added some additional funds, but we really feel like we have to take the same approach: be more conservative now. Because it, you know, if you grow, that's just that that growth it just becomes exponential, and you just eat up that that stability fund that much faster. So, you know, I realize 2.75 is feels like it's it's um, it's limiting and, and it's conservative, but you know. We can only raise taxes two and a half percent, so that's on you know that's on two point five percent that we're allowed to raise revenues every year, and we're saying raise the budget two point seven five. So, which begs the question: if the figures are correct on salary increases, we've already got a disconnect with nothing else mm -hmm. factored in. Yeah, we can't afford to pay. We can't afford to honor the contractual increases no, no. that we've already We can this year. Yeah, well, we, we can this year, and minutes. we can afford to continue honoring them, yeah. but it will be at the cost of something else, I guess is what I'm mm. saying. Yeah. I mean, at, we don't get enough money to it, at a 2.75% increase. It's not enough to cover, yeah. which is, which is, you know, when you're, when you're, you've, you've heard this said as well, but when the district, if, if you were running this like a business, I mean, 80% of our costs are in personnel. We've only got 20% that we can even play with, even if we did want to cut maintenance and supplies. That's the only, the rest of it is personnel. And when you cut a person, then you have the unemployment costs that go with it. It's just, this just becomes so frustrating. Depressing. Mr. Moore. Yeah, so I'd like to uh, put my two cents. I think what the question you asked you'd like to have an answer to is sort of what to do for the next meeting, the next presentation. I would. I think, um, from my perspective, the thing to do is to do um, essentially to flesh out the level service budget and, um, and then do district-wide cuts in case we actually have to do that, to have you know, start, start working on that plan. If, um, you know, if, because, you know, the things you read in the newspaper about how, what is the mass taxpayer saying that Charlie Baker underestimated his deficit by 100%. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, just really grim sort of things where, you know, there's going to, you know, it doesn't seem like it's likely to go up, but if it's going to go anywhere different, it seems like the amounts would be going down. So I, I would think a level service budget and then, um, and then, and then, and then just begin at least to sort of the same kind of thinking that you did with what would happen if 
you had a cost of additional transportation costs, but what would happen if we simply don't have enough money for the level service? Where would we start? How you know? What's the at least a, if not the specifics of cuts, at least the methodology and the, the kind of the thought process? Because I think, um, well, again, I think that's not something to rush into. <laughs> so you can, can no, I ask yeah, a clarifying question? Yeah. So the the only amount that we wouldn't be able to cover without uh, breaking the past tradition on the use of choice would be thirty four thousand. So, are you asking? You in this, in the oh. FY 16 year, are you asking for $35,000, $34,000 worth of district wide cuts? Because that's the amount over the 2.75? Yes. Um, right. Or, and, and like I said, maybe not the specifics, but just sort of how, you know, sort of the methodology, how we would go about looking at it, because it, it's sort of simple enough when to look at the high school, because then you're really only talking classes at the high school. Mm -hmm. But when you start district wide, it gets, there's many more apples and oranges being compared, it's even mm -hmm. more. Um, and so, to start that, and, it, and, and then I guess my thought is that it could be more than 34,000, depending on, again, what comes from the state. Sure. Mr. Vall. Okay. Um, I am looking up, and um, I don't even know where to start with this. It's a really hard decision as far as what to cut and what not to cut. I have to keep remi reminding myself that um, when the American um, Pediatric Association and the CDC did their studies, they said that late start time, late start times, later start times would benefit all students. When I'm looking at the cuts that were presented tonight, and you know, plate A or plate B, um, plate A was all the arts, or would that be whatever? But okay, plate B was the arts. Okay, well, that once again affects every student. So the late start time affects every student, the arts affects every student, and the AP program does not. The AP program, all the way up and through, I'm listening to differentiated instruction. That's the big thing right now. Um, you know, maybe Smith College will take on more classes. Maybe they won't. I don't think it's something that we need to rely on, but I do think that we need to do what's going to benefit all <coughs> students or the most students. And I, and I don't, I mean, if the kids are smart, then they're smart. And yes, they can be challenged. Um, I mean, my daughter's having that issue right now, if di differentiation, and I'm watching it in the middle school here and asking questions and seeing how it's working. And I don't understand why, that we have, when we have such talented teachers, if that's what we need to do, why we can't, and we're not talking about eliminating any of the programs also, so why we can't just um, do more differentiation within instruction within what we already have, like, I don't know if you have level ones or whatever. I don't know how that if that even does it anymore. It's just honors or not. Um, but maybe we need to look back at you know something some mixed classes. So um, and I'm also not sure if the only reason that the AP honors classes, if it's for knowledge that these kids are questing, or is it just going to look good on their um, college application? Um, because if they were to take a class, um, whether they took an AP class or not, I. I think you could take AP testing if you have the equivalent education of it, whether or not you took AP or whether you took it through Smith College. I think that you could still, if you took it through Smith College, you have the knowledge to be able to take the AP test. So anyway, I just, that's my two cents, is, is that which affects everybody. And um, I mean, I, I have a lot of research that I've looked at to really weigh out the late start time because I'd like to be able to say, you know what, why don't we just put that on the back burner? But that affects every student. And I'd like, it to be equal for all students and so that's what I have to say. Um, Ms. Hennessy and I think Principal Lombardi sure. also. I speak first because. Principal? Yeah, I would have to say um, it was a horrible day when we had to sit down and make these cuts and think about these cuts. Um, I, I think that um, this is all about students and um, whether, they, whether it's um, list one, list two, list, eight, list B, whatever, it does impact all our students because you're taking Northampton. One of the things about Northampton, if you think about what we stand for, um, you walk in each building, and you see the arts. So we stand for arts. You know, the other day when I was coming into um, the building on Monday, I was away last week, and I was, um, you know, really bothered when I knew that um, about these potential cuts. When I saw the email, get ready for the discussion cut based on um, the last school committee meeting, and I'm listening to the radio. And as I'm listening to the radio, I'm hearing about the gong show put on by the the, the um, Art Center. I'm like, so it's so ironic. I'm hearing about a community 
this, this building a mile from the school, we're potentially going to have to deal with cutting arcs. It doesn't seem to make sense. Um, I think people come to the community, community, people come to the high school for the arts. At the same time, they come for um, the rigor, the academic rigor. And here we are, you know, less than a mile from Smith College in this, in this fantastic interaction we have with Smith College for our students to take classes there. We had a situation um, in our biology class, the, the Smith professors rallied and sent our biology department. Not one teacher, but the department came up to help out. Um, these are things which make our school unique. These are things which draw students here. In regards to the late start, I think research shows, Phil, um, of course it helps students. It would help us if we got more sleep as adults. I think, and I think you know, we all know that. Um, philosophically, myself and every teacher in the building, philosophically, would support a late start. That's not the question. And as Jeremy Whalen said and as Dr. Provo said, it's not about a philosophical disagreement, it's about the implementation and the practicality. And I can't guarantee that every student will benefit from a late start. I don't know what their patterns will be at home or in the mornings. I don't think any of us do. The science is there, but we don't know the implementation. I do, however, know that cutting these classes, whether A or B, will impact students. Those students, whether they're doing it for whatever reason, it's their reason. If they want to do it for college, that's fine. If they want to do it because that, that's a passion they have, even more so. One of the things about Northampton, which is so great, is that we've taken down the, the barriers that prevent kids from getting into those classes. We don't have requirements. We don't have you to go through a maze to get there. What we say is if you have an interest, you have a passion, you have a desire, go take that class. You got to see maybe in your freshman English class, but all of a sudden you've read a book, you saw something, you want to take a chance at an AP class and, be, and um, be challenged at that level, go ahead and take it. This will take that away because we'll have to put those structures in place. Not only do we have to put structures in there that potentially will leave kids out of those opportunities, those students, all those lists represent um, a couple hundred kids. They will go someplace else. Not all of them will go to Smith College. They'll go back to other classes that are already high. So classes of 25, 23, 28 begin to go up to 30, 31. So I would argue that those cuts do impact the classes. They impact all those classes. And um, I think it's important to understand. These cuts will impact every student, I would say, in a much more tangible way than the benefits of that uh, perceived benefits of a late start. That's not scientific, though. I mean, scientifically, they've done research that states that this does help all students. So, I mean, I agree that most of it's your opinion, but whether or not you agree or disagree, it's actually a study done of, over three years of many different schools from the University of Minnesota that actually came up with all the data and which the American Phys um, Pediatric Association um, ended up calling it a, pu a public health crisis, one of the biggest ones that we can actually ad address. So I do understand that all students are affected by the arts, but you haven't gotten me that all students, because I know students that struggle. I know students that come to school just for the arts. I know st students who have a hard time getting up to go to school. If all of these kids can work on their circadian rhythm, which is actually what's been scientifically looked at and recommended, then it helps all students and not just the academically advanced students that want to challenge themselves. Because guess what? You can challenge yourself anywhere. If you're smart enough to do it, you can do it. What about the kids that struggle to get to school with, uh, you know, and with the whole circadian rhythm and don't have the parental support? A lot of the high achieving kids do have the parental and the familial support and have had it for all the years. You know, I can't, I can't address all the specifics you said. Um, I think we, we look at um, all our students. And I'm not sure if we break them down to the smart kids or the art kids. Um, there's a lot of crossover. Um, well, if and, 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 I'm not saying that. And, 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 and I think that um, though the pediatrics might have said there's a state of emergency for sleep, I'd say this is a state of emergency for education. What do we stand for? What does Northampton High School, what does the community stand for? And from a person that's come from, it's been here seven years, that's lived in the community for about 20 years, what Northampton High School stood out to me is a place of opportunity for students, of all students, for rigor, for arts, for academics, for interests. And there's a lot of crossover. Last night I was at a present presentation um, of our in, um, invent team, and this is a, a variety of students who have put together a grant through MIT, a very prestigious grant, working on developing um, a rowing machine for um, disabled people. You know, you take that up, and, and what was so fantastic, you're seeing these kids who love math, who love science, drawing on, that stuff starts in the classroom. 
how did they get that grant? That's a different. So hold on, let me finish. I mean, did they do it? Because this is an example. Let me finish. An example. Okay. Okay. And what I'm saying is that that starts in the classroom. That starts from the classroom of giving them the basic skills and the tools to do that. Okay. A few weeks ago, I was at um, the arts. I was at a creative, um, the um, songwriting class. It was a class that um, drew a variety of students, non-musicians, poetry um, students, and musicians coming together, collaborating, making music. You had mentioned Soul Duet. Um, come to the high school, and we have a fantastic collaboration from Lisa Leary's art class and her math on the ground floor, a whole Soul Duet um, display ba based on the premise of Soul Duet. The, um, them working together, collaborating. So this stuff, it's, it's, an inter, it's an integration of the smart and the, they're all smart. They're all wonderful, beautiful kids we, and it's a vibrant community. And I think anything you do takes away from that vibrancy. When you take away that column, we lose something at Northampton High School. You take away the other column, we lose something else. And we're gutting what is really the soul of Northampton High School. And I, and I, again, philosophically I support it, but I support Dr. Um, Provost fully that this is not the time to initiate um, you know, a late start at the cost of gutting such significant course opportunities for our students. You look at where kids go to class. We've had two students this year going to MIT. We've had a variety of students going to um, Cooper Union in our art program. So I can point in every direction how our students um, benefit from these programs. And either one is going to hurt students. We already have a major yeah. deficit. Can you answer my question that I asked you before, though? I mean, who, who was the one? You said these students got a, a grant. Yes. How did they get the grant? Did they do it? They worked with a teacher to submit. Uh, so back to the point, then, then if they're motivated and then they're smart and they, they want the academic rigor, they can go out and, and meet it and reach it themselves. Who is disagreeing, um, Bloom, so I can tell you. OK, I'm sorry. I do not agree where you're coming from. I think it's educationally sound um, to keep these programs there. I'm not denying that there is research and scientific data that shows people benefit from more sleep. Of course, I'm not saying that. But I can tell you that when students are in front of teachers of Ms. Leary's caliber, of Mr. Selfridge's caliber, and they are being challenged, that, I think, is scientific. And they do benefit from that. And that's all I can tell you. Is it a part opinion? Sure. But I think when I see these students every day, when I walk the halls every day, and I see the kids at the Invent the, um, team last night, when I see the kids in the musical in a few weeks, I see kids benefiting what is offered at the high school. And I'd be remiss to say otherwise and to um, support anything other than keeping those classes in um, intact. Ms. Hennessy. I got to uh, say a few things. Um, thank you. Um, I, as you know, teach in another district, and we look at Northampton, literally. I mean, I always kind of brag now, like, well, I, I live there. Um, for your AP program um, and the arts. Yeah. And the AP, like, you had that grant, we're part of that grant, mm -hmm. and you have unbelievable number of students. And I would actually disagree with you here, Blue. I do think, I think the arts saves kids. I agree with you. Um, I actually think you're wrong about the AP. I, th I see it saving kids, too. A lot I of see kids who are, I think, I think sometimes people think, oh, only the high achievers are AP. No, I have special ed kids in my AP, I'm sure you do too, who want that challenge, who want to go to college and want the experience. And more importantly, well, that's not more importantly, and equally important is so many low-income students want that opportunity to get that college credit. So AP US history, they get eight credits at UMass. European history, eight credits. Spanish, eight credits for getting that. That is thousands of dollars for low-income, for any student. I, I think that it is a brave disservice to not offer that. And then my, my more really, really, pro so I don't want, ever want to cut the arts. I want to increase the arts. I know we can't. Um, and I would say the same about EP. I think it, it makes us strong. And I don't think anyone in this whole community would dispute the science of the late start. I think, and I don't want to judge anyone for saying it's more important than AP, and I don't want to judge people for saying that the arts and AP are more important than late start. I think we're all making a really hard decision with this trade-off. Um, and I, I think it's a horrible, but a real practical thing, you said in another presentation that almost 22% of incoming ninth graders are f had not been in Northampton Public Schools prior to that. I think if we cut the arts and or AP, that we're going to lose some of those, and we're going to lose some of those people to charter schools, and that's, to me, devastating. And I, well, I'd, I'd also say that what I, think, what I think is important is that um, one of the things that we're very proud of at the high school is our culture. And um, we, had this, we had a discussion recently about lunch, and um, 
you know, high school lunch versus middle school lunch, and it's how, how kids are. And, you know, one of the things I can say uh, that I'm most proud about, and um, I hope our community is, is the level of how our students interact with each other. And what I would hate to see is this, the type of list that we've given um, become divisive. Yeah. The art kids versus the smart kids. You know, the kid, the, these kids are saved, these ones don't need saving, because they, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm hesitant, I think that's dangerous. Because what we are, we are, we are a community. We're an educational community. We are a diverse community. And one of the things that I can say happens every single day at Northampton <laughs> high, um, high School, this diversity comes together and it works. You know, the art kids, the smart kids, whatever label we, I mean, let's, be, let's not put labels. I thought we're trying to get away from labels. These kids come together and they help each other. They support each other on a daily basis. And I think, again, if we're gonna talk about late start or we're gonna talk about, um, programming, it's about making sure it programs for everybody. And it's not about let's save this one particular group and let that one, they can fend for themselves. It's not that. They, they, it's a very cohesive, supportive culture at our high school. Well, I'm sorry if you thought that I want anyone to fend for themselves, but I didn't see the AP as being cut, I mean eliminated. We're talking about eliminating arts. So I just want to say that, you know, maybe more people can fit into the AP classes. We already have such a, I mean, we. We lose so many students already to other schools. I think we ought to start to look at how to get them back. So okay. one of got people with their hands up. Yes, exactly. I'm trying to make sure that other people have an opportunity to speak. So Good. Carrie. Thank you. I, my comment would be a combination of what a lot of people have said, but I think there are huge trickle down effects to cut AP program in particular. I know that people, sometimes people move into Northampton just because of the schools and the classes that they offer. If we don't offer the AP classes, as people have said, those kids are gonna go elsewhere. And the money that we lose for those kids going elsewhere is going to have a huge trickle down effect on all the students. So there are many ways that cutting those classes and cutting those programs are gonna impact all the students. I originally was a proponent of Late Start, but I just can't see how we can um, institute Late Start at the cost of these programs I I just don't think it's anything that we can do um, part of the argument for late start was that there was increased um, I, well I don't need I don't I, that it was better for kids but I think it's difficult for us to measure the, exactly how it's better for kids you know what I'm saying They've said that studies were done and it, achievement improved, but it's impossible for us to predict how much achievement would improve for which students is that, and is it actually all students or is it most students and so statistically it's a good thing or is it really every student has improved achievement and at what level? And you know, some of the, some of the discussion in some of the late start previous conversations had to do with the fact that we already have kids who are performing at very high levels. Some of, you know, is, are, are, are they really going to improve a great deal more? And is, I, I guess I'm think, I'm, I'm just questioning whether late start really does benefit all students and whether it really is a, in, a, in a measurable enough way that it's worth what we can calculate as being a measurable problem for for cutting some other things. I think if we were talking about if if we had three things and we were talking about cutting one or the other of them, that would be equal. But we're talking about adding one at the expense of cutting something else, and that's when it becomes awkward for me. I'm not making any sense, but that's I mean, okay. okay. Um, it's Fallon, and then Mr. Ball. I was just going to say, I, I, I understand, I think you were making sense, and I do understand that it's hard to measure, and I know this is a stretch, but it seems like everybody wants to study the effects. We're in the five college areas, aren't there any universities or research programs that want to take us on as a project and maybe study, you know, do some groundwork next year, and then fund the later start and see where we are in two years and say, you know, is that something that you really saw a profound enough result? <laughs> you know what I mean? I just, have we really hit up every possible avenue for some other funding for this? Because it's true, we won't know. We wouldn't know, the, and even, yeah, I don't know, yes. Look at me. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. Next. <laughs> I am. No, I, 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 I was just going to say that um, 
we're talking a lot about school performance, but the American Academy of Pediatrics is not an educational organization. They focus primarily on health. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, I can sort of sense where the school committee wants to go with this, so I won't belabor the point, but this is not about okay. school performance, which anything is incredibly difficult to measure the effect, the, the actual discrete effect, whether it's class size, whether it's teacher skill, whether it's any program, because there are so many variables involved. But I think if you look at childhood obesity, which we know is a problem, I mean, Northampton has 30%, just like the rest of the country, um, not having sleep is just not healthy. Okay. So and if true. we don't yeah. wish to confront it, then we don't. But I just don't want it to get conflated with that. My other question is, what about the gym teachers? Because I, yeah, that's, that's, I, I, you know, I was wondering whether that was included in this. It's not included. Okay. So that's just makes me even more sad. Sober. Because <laughs> yeah. um, that's that was five full time equivalents. I think was the most expansive. Yes. Uh, I, I, if I may. Sure. Please. I think. I can say with confidence whatever plan we bring is going to have to be significantly contracted from that based on right. looking at our five year. Right. I, was, I was hoping that there would be some efficiencies gained from allowing other athletic endeavors to count, but still it's going to be more than just more for than people who may be watching at home. That's mm -hmm. in, a, in a trying to move toward um, meeting our requirements of phys ed, which we haven't been at the high school. And so that's been a goal to try to move toward that. And that's going to require staffing um, to do that. Um, so to Me? kind of, sure, sure. OK, the data. You wanted to know the data. The three-year project using data for more than 9,000 students attending eight high schools in three states. Um, and they, what they did was they co collected comparative data about students' academic performance, including grades, attendance, tardiness, and performance on state and nationalized, national standardized tests, and car crash data was also examined. Um, and they found that switchi when switching to a later start time, attendance, standardized test scores, and academic performance in math, English, science, and social studies improved. Tardiness, substance abuse, symptoms of depression and consumption of caffeinated drinks decreased. And if you go into it, the obesity and, and the associated factors also decreased. So that's the research. And that right there comes from the Discover magazine out of the University of Minnesota. It's um, of the education. So, but I have other ones too. They all say around the same thing. I just picked one. So I guess what we need to do is try to focus in for the superintendent because he's asking us um, as he sits down with Ms. Walczak to, to now take this from a first pass to start actually building the budget that he wants to bring before you, we need to give him some guidance leaving this meeting what we need to do. Um, so if you defer to the first chair. I would, just, I would just add my two cents before I, I, I would offer my suggestion to the superintendent. And, um, you know, my observation on the presentation tonight was that I appreciate the thoroughness <coughs> of the presentation and the work that you did with the business administrator around looking long term as well as short term. So although we're looking at this year trying to figure out a way to get the, um, the late start as part of the budget and now we'll, we'll uh, make a recommendation to you as to whether or not um, one of those uh, scenarios that you offered would be um, something that we would like you to pursue for your budget book. I just I, I want to thank you for considering the, the budget further out because I think the mayor in the city has done uh, a great uh, service to us to bring stabilization to our city for the next few years and to have a plan that aligns itself with the city um, we know that there will be a time when the funds will run out and without any more state aid coming in um, we may be going back to our constituents, the people who we live around in our city, and ask them again for an override. Um, we're trying to avoid that, and the, the city and the mayor has done a very a good job to, to create a plan and to even try to push it out farther. And to have a plan here in the school department that kind of um, mirrors that, I think only helps us stay in line with the city. So I, I do very much appreciate your work and I, and I support the work that you continue to do to try to keep the, um, the cuts away from, from our table for as long as possible. Um, 
to you new members that have joined us in the last couple of years. Um, consider yourself blessed that you hadn't had to sit in. And as Ms. Minnick said, uh, as we saw the, the budget presented tonight, to see things built back in that we um, negligently cut um, because our backs were against the wall and uh, the cuts would have been uh, to a point that they were just unpalatable, that we slashed parts of the budget and never restored it to where it should be uh, fully funded so it operates in a way in which our business administrator can actually use pots of money to pay the bills from those accounts and not have to search for it. Um, they've done a great job, trust me when I say that, in trying to create a budget that is actually sound and can, can be worked from and not have to uh, go to other pools of money to try to find resources to pay bills that should be planned for throughout the year. So I, I, cannot, I cannot stress how, how, um, how wonderful it is to have uh, a budget that takes all those things into consideration. And um, you know, whether, whether I seek re-election next year uh, or who replaces Ms. Minnick as she leaves or any of us as will be up for re-election, um, I think it's very wise to think uh, to the future, whether you find yourself at this table or your seat is filled by another individual. You owe it to those folks to look out beyond the decision you make tonight or next month to those that will be making decisions in the future that will impact the students of Northampton. That's what we're charged to do, to take care of each student and wisely spend the tax dollars that uh, are entrusted to us to make those decisions. So um, as we think long term and, and we look at the budgets in the future, um, it's very tempting to want to add something in because this year it seems like it'll be a great year for students. But in years to come, you'll find yourself wrestling with some very, very difficult decisions um, because you you feel and you'll see the disservice that will bring to students as well. So um, thank you very much. And with that, I would, uh, my recommendation to you, Superintendent, um, is to go uh, with the, the initial plan on a level service budget, which, um, you know, which does not um, put any cuts to the arts, puts no cuts to the uh, AP program, and unfortunately, doesn't allow for the, the later start time. So are you making that in the form of a sort of a motion or? That would be my recommendation, okay. but if it's, if well, we can uh, I, would, we can I would be happy to bring it forward as okay. a motion and see if it has any support. Ms. Ms. Hanna? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't really have much to add, but I think it is a really difficult situation we're faced with. Um, what are we charged with? What are we prioritizing? Um, I think it is really clear that if we were to prioritize late start, we'd be prioritizing moving in the direction of prioritizing the health and wellness of our students. And it becomes, it's a difficult situation um, that we're faced with. You know, it'd be nice to, um, I mean, I, I can't help but sort of think bigger of how this country, and this is a little bit of a speech making and I'll make it really short, how this country, what this country prioritizes and this country clearly does not prioritize human beings. Um, it prioritizes uh, power and wealth, and, um, and that's kind of a sad statement um, that we're seeing. So we're coming down to this very local level. You know, we're having to kind of make a tough decision of kind of going with the status quo of what we have prioritized, which is the arts, which is rigor, um, you know, at the cost of, of the health and wellness of our students. We would hit these same conversations if we really wanted to start talking about what students were eating in the cafeteria and what the cost would be to really feed yep. students nutritious local food. So, you know, it's, um, I think sometimes it is easier to, to stay with the status quo when we feel like we don't really have good options. So it doesn't really move us anywhere, but. <laughs> Just along those lines, I mean, at right. the superintendent's right. entry findings stated that there were some serious concerns in the district that he felt like needed to be addressed and he wanted to have some time now to look for the root causes. We had a brief discussion with him after uh, the evaluation meeting uh, earlier this week, um, several of us, and the, it, the, 
the concern is when you look for the root causes of some of the some of the specific things that he found in his entry findings, it gets down to social emotional things for some, many of our students, and it's things that the schools um, that are not necessarily the school's responsibility to handle, like health and wellness are not necessarily the school's responsibility to handle, and yet no one else is handling them, and so we do handle them to the extent that we can. And, and in order for us to be able to teach our students, we have to handle some of those things. So we do provide meals for students, maybe not the level of, you know, we, we could be having the conversation about what we serve in the cafeteria, and we could do a better job of those things. but. It's, it, I don't know. This is, it's just really complex. There are a lot of expectations of the school department beyond just educating the kids about math and science and English or whatever it is. There are, and we have, we have taken on a number of roles over the years providing a lot of other things. I think that we are, I think that the schools are largely responsible for creating the adult human beings that you see walking the streets. So. In that respect, I actually think that considering the late start time is important. It's it's one of those factors that contributes to the to the emotional wellness of our students. So from that perspective, I agree that it would be an important thing to look at. And if I could be convinced that changing the start time at the high school was going to make a huge difference in the health and well-being of 900 kids, I would probably be voting in favor of it. But when you consider what the costs will be, and, and I fall back to, to uh, maybe this is a cop-out, maybe this is me saying I don't want to be the one to make the decision, but I'm falling back to a recommendation from our superintendent and a recommendation from the high school principal. Both of them have said that from their perspective as educators, that the late start time makes sense, but that it's not worth giving up some of the other stuff that we would have to give up. And that's truly a function of our financial predicament, and I don't know how we fix that unless there's an infusion of cash from someplace that we haven't identified yet. Like, <laughs> like maybe there is some place around here that's going to... I'm going to pursue it. Okay, you <laughs> good for you. But, but until that, until she comes back with the, <laughs> with the purse full of money, I think I, my, my own... <clears throat> feeling is that we have to just follow the recommendations of the people that we've employed to to lead our district and to carry out our district, to carry out what we want in our district, I should say. Other, um, Mr. Byer. Mr. Byer. Can I ask a very, this is, this is peripherally related to this high <laughs> debate. Sure. Um, so in the last, last year's fiscal 15, the level services increase was 528,000. Are, and that's 2.1. It was 2.1 percent of that budget. I'm just wondering this year's increase of 810 for salaries. And that's not even including all the other things that we're maintaining level services. Is three percent? And I'm just wondering, was last year's budget wrong, or are we paying? I mean, are we paying? I mean, because that was that, no, that was. I can't but, answer that. <laughs> but I mean, it's just the weird thing is, if in fact we over budgeted for ESPs, the number should be wrong in the opposite direction. I think the ESPs have been over budgeted for a number of years though, no, but so. I mean, but that, that should make that number, right? Yeah. yeah it, it should, should be. it pushes in the opposite. You would say, oh, 528, that's wrong. You subtract the ESP pay right. from that. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, what is happening this year that's taking us from 2.1% growth to cover all of level service increases from fiscal 14 to fiscal 15, and this year is 3%, and that's just for salaries. So I guess that's my, I'm just, it's not making sense. To me, it, I, I can see if I can find it. I mean, yeah, I can't I mean, recreate it's, it's, the 15 budget, but one question I would ask that I can look up when I get back to the office is, did you spend more money on school choice in FY15 than you did in 14? If you spent an additional 200,000 in school choice in 15 than you had in 14, there's 200,000. Right. Uh, and that's easy to look up. I, yeah. you know, I can look that. Part. Yeah, I think I think that I made a note a few years ago that we would have to make up for school choice. I wasn't aware though last year that was an issue, but it just again, you're right. If you're pulling money from reserve account, it makes it the increase look smaller. But um, but that's why I guess 
that amount to that 520 it was for everything I guess 810 is for collective bargaining even 810 looking back at our previous history for collective bargaining and obviously we had some years where we had contractual we had contractual zeros um, for the base wage adjustment but other than the one year in 2011 um, we're still paying the four and a half percent and three percent step increases and if I'm remembering co correctly we usually were tracking around five hundred thousand dollars for wage increases. Steps for, for unit A alone are close yeah. to four hundred thousand dollars next year. Well wait that's what I'm just wondering half why right. why that the steps are so much seem to be so much higher if the steps for the entire again that was the information that was being presented to me as a school committee member was that the steps for all of the employees were five hundred thousand um, dollars. So I'm just wondering what has happened you know, is it just a change in the demographics of the workforce that have made this go from 400 to 800? And if the steps for unit A alone are 400,000, then that means that the steps for the rest of the employers are 400,000 as well? Now you've got, you've got the steps for the rest of the employees, you've got, you've the, got the base wage. The one and a half percent COLA increase for right. all of the employees, and, and that came to, I believe, you know, just over 700,000, and I'm doing this from memory. Okay. Is this because the didn't it go up the last day of the year and then it goes up again? No, it's a one point, it's a blended 1.5%. Okay. So right. that, that was taken into account. So I'm just, okay. it's I'm just, I'm so it sounds like something we, you'd be able to sit down with. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely yeah. it's just curious about the numbers. Have a little Excel party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another eight hours. <laughs> As if there's anything wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with this. That's how I spend most of my days. <laughs> So, uh, okay, um, other, other questions, other comments? Um, do we want to give the superintendent a clear, do we want to just, you know, get the sense of the committee or do mm -hmm. you want to take a vote or what, I don't know what your preference is in terms of giving you a clear direction. I think sense of the committee would be appropriate at this time since we don't have a vote on the agenda. That's true, yeah, and also, yeah, exactly. So, uh, Else other folks <laughs> want to want to weigh in on what they would like to see the superintendent if you haven't already done that um, don't look at me I think I've waited you've more waited than a lot <laughs> oh, I agree with that okay I agree with that okay you agree with that oh yeah. sorry okay thanks <laughs> Okay. Uh, any other any other questions or other uh, comments uh, before we close tonight's meeting Okay. I'm not clear. Okay. I'm sorry. So, I think the did everyone give their opinion? Or? I heard everyone. Oh, you did? Okay, I didn't. So, I just wasn't okay. listening. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but it wasn't always bottom line. It was not always oriented okay. to bottom line. So. Um, okay. So, then uh, we are now at a point of adjournment. I would just, before adjour asking for a motion to adjourn, I would just let people know that our next uh, school committee meeting where we'll continue this this uh, look at the budget will be March 12th 2015 7 15 here and then we'll have a follow-on meeting on March 26 2015 uh, as well here at 7 15 a community room we'll okay. do adjourn there's second been, there's been a motion made and seconded all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed any abstentions the meeting is adjourned